Maggie G has written 15 books to great acclaim, and these works have been translated into 14 languages. Uh, these include Virginia Woolf in Manhattan and The Blue, which are both available just outside, and most recently Blood, uh, which was published this year. One of Grant's original Best of Young British Novelists, she was the first woman chair of the Royal Society of Literature and has been shortlisted for global prizes, including the Orange Prize and the Dublin International Impact Prize. In 2012, she was awarded an OBE for services to literature. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can give you that. In the same year, uh, there was an international conference about her work at St. Andrews University. She's a professor of creative writing at Bath Swa University. Sarah Hart won the 2019 Brian McMahon Short Story Award for her story, Submerged. In 2017, she was highly commended for the Manchester Fiction Prize. She's the author of two novels, The Better Half and Thick and Thin, which went to numbers one and three in the national book charts. She is currently working on a collection of short stories. Hart and G's writing engage with questions of class, in particular investigating the tension between middle class values and middle class behaviour. In her memoir, G talks about how being born into two families, both working class, has meant that an inherited sense of being an outsider, looking slightly askance at what the privileged get up to, remains at the core of my adult self. In her short stories, The Blue, the colour is subtly present throughout, whether it's peaceful and soothing or, more often, cold and empty. Outwardly concerned with their social and material status, her characters often inwardly question their emotional safety. Are they loved? Do they, do they still love who they're with, or even like them? Are they real? Are they seen? Are they heard? Hard short stories are at once intimate and energetic. Their sharp humour and deeply affecting emotional core make for addictive reading, with characters recurring to different stories, several set in core, including a 90s story where we haven't yet taken the bait, nobody's getting on the ladder, the country remains unmortgaged. And around the mecca of St. Henry's, the democracy of it, the egalitarian vibe, where every man, jack and child is off their head, working class, middle class, nobody gives a fuck. <laughs> Both authors ex explore ideas of restrictive family orthodoxy, the struggle against or surrender to doing what's expected, and what it means to resist the mainstream idea of living successfully. In other words, this is liter literary fiction that fully engages with real life. Please welcome Maggie Jean and Sarah Hart. I mentioned the class awareness I see in your work, and I'm wondering how conscious you are of that element of your writing when, you know, during the process of, of writing. And I think it's very hard to write. Is this on, by the way? Can you hear yes. yes. Yeah. Um, when I'm writing about British things, class comes up a lot. Um, but I do write about international things as well, but it's certainly very important because I think if you're not born to privilege, you always notice it, whereas there aren't so many people born to privilege who are aware of what they have. In a sense, of course, we're all born to privilege, we know that, we're all relatively rich. But yeah, it, and there's so much comedy in it, class is full of, you know, it's, it's very funny. So, um, yeah, tragic and funny. Uh, I'm fascinated to hear that Sarah um, has the same awareness. Oh, yeah, well, I forgot how to do that. That was good. Um, yeah, in my case, it's probably more unconscious. I just find I write stories and class comes into it unconsciously. Um, it's not a deliberate thing on my part. And I would give a slightly different answer in the sense that I think for parts of my life they've been quite mainstream. For instance, I was a lawyer for a while and was in a big corporate law firm and even now to this day about eighty percent of my friends are corporate lawyers and bankers. So in some way I've lived that life, but for whatever reason, I don't know why, I always feel a need to <coughs> kick back against it and lash against it. And I kind of find in Ireland anyway that and I'm sure this is the case in other countries, but I've only ever lived here. 
Um, I just find the definition of what is successful to be extremely narrow, particularly since we had an economic boom. It got narrower and narrower. And that's something that comes up in this story, actually. So there's just something very restrictive about it, and there's something that makes me want to kick against it. But I don't set out deliberately to do it. It's just every single time I read a story, when I'm finished and I look back and go, oh, you know, I definitely t take a shot at the kind of the mainstream of the establishment. Yeah. I agree, actually, that I don't deliberately do it, but it's obviously part of the way I see the world. And I also agree, I mean, you know, it, you can't be a novelist without being middle class. It's not possible. It means you've got the education, and it means you're very lucky. You've got this job that people want. But your birth family, I think, always stays with you. And in my case, the uncles and the aunts and the grandparents, because that's where you first learn to be. And that's where you perhaps never think it would be possible to be a writer. And that sense of distance, I think, is quite valuable as a writer because you see things differently when you see them from far away. Um, and then, of course, if you move into that sphere, you might see what your own behavior and the behavior of others as slightly comic. Um, because I think I'm often laughing at myself in my stories, things I've actually done or said. Um, it's not just, I'm not kind of really laughing at others. It's, I'm part of the dance, you know, I know I am. Well, in my case, I have to say, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said it was a conscious political thing. For me, it's just, I've always, you know, found, you know, plowing the kind of the main furrow or, you know, cleaving to the mainstream at times just incredibly dull. And, and in a way, the story, kind of the first time I ever realised it was this nightclub I used to go to, which comes up in the story, and I just realised I preferred it was freer, you know. I just find kind of, so it's not necessarily overtly political on my part, it's just... I've kind of got to this point to, I suppose, just finding the mainstream quite dull at times. I'm not exactly an anarchist now, so I'm not trying to set myself up as some sort of... Yeah, which side are you on in, in the revolution, which is coming? Well, my dad's actually sitting in the audience, and once years ago when I was espousing certain views when I was much younger, he said, just know this, when the revolution comes, you'll be first up against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you, it's useful to you to find that friction by pushing against... Something is that no, I just think it's instinctive, and you know, maybe I get it from home or something. I don't know, it's just, it's just the lens through which I look at life, you know. Yeah, I, I want to excuse myself from the charge of being overtly political. I'm not overtly political, anything overt in writing is a bad idea. Yeah, yeah and I think that, that's that's where. I see it as an element. I don't see a message or an ideology behind it, you know, um, which makes it more powerful. It's just, if you're interested in how the world works, if you're interested in where power lies, if you're interested in the differences between people, and even if you're interested in how human beings behave as a species, that can be seen as good. Yeah. And that, to me, is the whole of but I, I groan when if people say, you know, political writing, because nobody wants political writing. They just don't. They say they do, but they don't. So I think it's got to be good writing, you know. It's got to be storytelling. And the, the rest, it's great if it's found. But I would never set out to be a political writer. But like in terms of being political, storytelling is the most powerful thing. And we had... You know, in Ireland we had um, concrete examples of that, like in the marriage equality referendum here, that passed overwhelmingly. And I think the sense I got from speaking to people who were involved in the campaign and just as a citizen watching it was part of the reason it did was they very, very cleverly, rather than lecturing people about sort of politics, they harness people's stories and through the telling of people's stories, you know, so it was quite moving. People would come out and say, you know, it might be an 80 year old man living in rural Ireland, but he realised that his nephew was gay. So it was through that thing of storytelling that you actually change the political um, dynamic, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there was a stud there's a study in the US around this where just giving people the information and the kind of reasoning behind the argument really didn't move the needle at all, whereas the personal story 
that absolutely flips someone from zero to ten on, on that scale? Actually, it was a study of the effect of Obama's speeches during the last election. And when he gave a speech that was saying to the Americans, be better people, we've got to do better than this, we are, we've got to be good people, the vote went against him. But when he actually produced information, new information, i.e., do you know about the number of Muslim firefighters in the US, do you know about the number of people working in the health service, then the votes switched <coughs> towards him and the effect on viewers was to counter prejudice. So it's about surprising people rather than lecturing to them. Um, but it was a very interesting study. Yeah. So this was written um, just after the war in Iraq. So you will understand why, which in other forms is still dragging on, um, which also inspired me to write a novel called The Flood. Um, but the reason why I need to know the date is because older people didn't have mobiles in 2003, and that made writing stories much easier. Okay, So um, you have to believe that the main protagonist doesn't have a mobile for it to make sense. Okay. What was important is the name of the story. As Cicely tried to get her trolley, two young men stood full in the way, talking explosively in Arabic. Probably the war, Cicely considered. Coming through, sorry, she caroled. Terribly sorry, I have a family to feed. The supermarket felt big and unhealthy, <coughs> chilled as death, indifferent. Did her husband love her? He never said. If Gabriel loved her, she'd be all right. Cicely told herself she knew what was important. Today, though, had gone wrong from the beginning, all those tangles of littleness. Cicely had quarrelled mildly with the twins, annoyed her husband by asking him to come home early, failed to clinch a time with the emergency plumber for the downstairs lavatory, which was important when she was entertaining 20 people. There'd been three missed phone calls that might have been the plumber. Two today, when she was tidying the garden. Then she'd seen it was two o'clock, so yet again she hadn't run back because she had to rush out and finish the shopping. The fridge was a blaze of photographic light. Inside she could see only whole pale bodies. Exasperated, Cecily beckoned over a stolid young woman in a headscarf. Where are the flies? she demanded crossly. Where are the wings? You always have wings. Cooked or raw, the girl sat on smiling. Cooked, cooked, she snapped unfairly and felt guilty to see the plain face flinch under its frowning band of cloth. To compensate, she started babbling. Nice cooked joints for a barbecue. Did you say cooked for a barbecue? <laughs> and now the creature sneered as if she was unbalanced. Cicely wasn't going to explain that this was an autumn barbecue, that most of the food would be warmed in the oven and just finished off outside in the fire. Look over there, then, the child instructed. Cecily did not say thank you, though she found what she wanted, honey gold limbs of corn-fed birds, ranked in pairs, ready cooked, glistening, slicked with oil and flamed at the edges. She rushed on round the store, trooping on steak, mushroom, salad, the usual sugary twins for the twins. So she read drinks for the twins. Then she remembered they were adults too. Oh no, well, she can't do more wine. They were growing up. They were going away. The barbecue was to mark this moment. Sam and Pam. They were not identical, had never been dressed in matching clothes, but now they were heading for the same frontier. She'd asked around a dozen or so of their friends, all of them going to different universities, and their parents too, to celebrate. On the way to the till, she snatched up a paper. On the front page, the wretched wall, a black and white picture of flames and confusion. Words were written right across the photo. She glanced at it briefly. It must be some kind of poster. Without her glasses, she couldn't really see. She had a nephew, David, in the army. The traffic was appalling. Her life was hard. Is anyone going to help? She called as she staggered into the house with her bags. Pam! Sam! Sam? Are you there? It was Sam, of course, who came and helped. Well-meaning, but inept, as usual, 
managing to drop half the grapes on the floor. She sighed as she peeled the squashed skins from the tiles, pale as frog spawn. The same old Sam. I'll do that, Mum. It's all right, though I have got a headache. He made her go upstairs for a rest. She had a moment of pure pleasure as she tucked her aching feet up on the bed and reached across for her newspaper. Today was the health day, which she always enjoyed, planning ways to improve the condition of her family. For song, Sam was shockingly soft and unfit. Pam was the one who did weightlifting. And her husband, of course, was too stone too heavy, as she last remarked last night at table, Daddy is dreadfully overweight. Don't say it in front of me, though, said Gabriel. Middle-aged men did tend to be touchy. Lean men, beautiful, hard male bodies. She found herself thinking of her nephew, David. David, the son of her husband's brother, was effortlessly tall and fit, sleek and golden, graceful, male, needing to shave twice a day when he lived with them to keep his cheeks smooth, and there was always that attractive blue shadow. What was the truth? He was her favourite. In some ways, he looked like a younger Gabriel, and Gabriel adored him uncritically, odd when he was quite hard on Sam. For two years, David had been under their roof after he quarrelled with his father, finishing his sixth form en famille with them. He was their second son, really, or so she told him, hoping Sam wasn't listening. David was never a swat like Sam. He had so many friends, such fun, such charm. But of course, when the results came through, his parents made David feel so guilty that he went off to redeem himself in the army. It's going to be brilliant. Adventure, travel, and Dad will finally be proud of me. But David, she said, there is a war on. Oh, come on, Auntie, we'll have a laugh. And now, bizarrely, he was in Iraq, but she supposed he was an officer, surely, or maybe not, with grades like those. She told herself to go down and start cooking, but glanced in parting at the paper's front page. At first she stared uncomprehending, but then she realised that the writing across it was not, in fact, part of the picture at all. Someone had scribbled on her paper. A biro edition by some stranger. The photograph was black and white, of a tank with a ragged crown of flames, somewhere in Iraq, she deduced. A hot white sky, a mess of burning. The letters, not well formed, scrawling, asked, what he think? This is holiday, so he gets suntan. She took a second look at the photo and realised she had completely failed to see the blazing figure at its centre, leaping from the tank, a burning man, fringed with fire down his straight, narrow outline like a mane of flame on a horse's neck. But when she looked closer, the fire was eating him, small, savage tooth marks eroding his outline. What he think? He gets suntan. Burning to death? What would that be like? She thought of it with crawling horror. Mum, the loo still isn't flushing. She went. Sam was standing on the loo seat, perched awkwardly, trying to peer into the high system. Get down, Sam, you'll never manage it. She couldn't control an edge of impatience, and he thundered down, grunting, flinging out one arm, which managed to knock over the blue striped toothbrush mug, scattering the tight little family of toothbrushes, which flew across the floor as the china shattered. Honestly, Sam, leave it alone. I'm going to have to get the man. I am a man, he said, rattled. I can do things, Mum. Give me a chance. Quite soon she was hacking at the stakes while Sam mooned about in the kitchen doorway. She only wanted them all to be happy. By the way, Sam, is Rafiq coming? Is he still vegetarian? Yes, Rafiq and both his parents, but it isn't Rafiq's lot who are veggie. It's Fadia, actually. She's become a vegan. Mm, those things are a bit difficult, aren't they? It's nothing to do with being a Muslim, Mum. She'll eat the rice and the barbecue buns. She can have extra wine, said Cicely kindly, and then remembered. No, they don't drink. Fadia could drink you under the table. His knowing superior face annoyed her. They're not best at everything, you know. Why don't you go and get the barbie ready? Your father won't be back until seven. I'm doing it, Ma. I fixed it with Dad, Pam yelled through over the noise of the TV. Dad said he wants me to do it with him. I'm brilliant with fires. I'm about to get started. Can I do the salad? Sam asked his mother, reciting the fat of the scarlet mussel. It was more gristle than she expected. 
She cut too hard and sliced her thumb. Blood flowered red on the kitchen towel. No, she exploded. Just go away, Sam. I will soon be gone, he said with dignity. Remember, that's why you're having the party. Don't be a bitch, Mum, Pan said lightly, hugging her mother as she pushed out of the door. He's probably capable of cutting up a lettuce. Mm. Cicely caught her arm on a sudden impulse and turned to Sam and clutched his hand. I love you both. They froze for a moment, then the twins both laughed and Sam ruffled her hair. Her husband was late. Most of the guests were here. The garden was filling up with noise and laughter. The sky was the deep glowing blue after sunset, a band of lemon gold around their urban horizon, sharpening the scarcely trees and the rooftops. Silver planes scored slowly across from the Heathrow, people flying off into the hopeful evening, and the children would fly, she thought, all over the world, who knew where they would go, but make them safe and happy. She herself was happy now, suddenly. Her white pyracanthus, so late this year, had a depth like lit bone against the indigo. Everything was perfect, perfectly peaceful. How silly to have let that paper upset her. The birds fell quiet, the barbecue glowed, red and white coals at the top of the lawn, and the young people's bodies flashed smoothly past the fire as they wheeled and gyrated and greeted each other, hugging as if they would never part. All of them are here, thought Cicely, moved. Rafi and Emily, Bunny with Adam, both the Fosters, oh, and there's Fadia, the Caldecott clan, Leonie and Sarah. She relaxed at last as she saw in the distance her own husband pushing through the glass doors, as if in slow motion, it seemed to her. And she sucked her first long, cold drink of champagne and savoured the salt and sweet smell of meat cooking. All of us are here in this garden together, as if we shall never change or die. All of the faces from my children's childhood, they have grown up. Thank God we have made it. And the flushed, roughened faces of the other parents smiled as she called, At last, here's Gabriel. Now, a toast to all our children. But why is he walking so slowly, so heavily? The phone in the house is ringing again. And as Gabriel comes near us, People fall away, and he says, My dear love, it's about David. Yeah, it's, it's even more of a gut punch hearing it read than it is than it was when I read it first. You know, it's a, um, I'm curious actually, I wonder, am I, in terms of the whole collection, am I reading into this too much with the, the motif of blue? Um, is that, was that something pre-planned? Was it something that kind of developed as you were putting it together? I it developed as I was putting it together. It's, it's my favourite colour. You know, it's the best thing we've got on top of this internet, I think. And see, um, and I suppose some of the stories are in a minor key, although I always use humour. But I think one of the most enjoyable things, as a, as a novelist, one of the things I love about doing a collection of short stories is placing it and trying to make it make sense as a whole, perhaps. Um, Incidentally, my poor husband, he's always telling me he loves me, so please don't think it's about him. Um, I do sometimes put these men in, but I also think, I, I don't know what you think, Sarah, but I think young men are in a great deal of trouble at the moment. You know, it's very difficult for them. These suicide figures this year have just come up again, a rise in, in male suicide. So I, I think there's something very touching to me about, lovable about young men. I just don't know. I think it's really difficult for them. I think, you know, obviously life is much better for us now as women. And in some ways that's made things better for men, but in other ways it hasn't made things better for men. Um, well, the suicide so, rate, I went to a conference in UCD last year in behavioural economics and just keeping to the net point, the suicide rate for young males in Ireland, I think, is the highest in Europe. Certainly that was the figure quoted by an English professor last year, the, the strong bar charts and Sadly, it's very high, and I know anecdotally 
I have a 22 year old and would have been around a lot of young men for a while and certainly on the basis of what I sadly have seen there are a lot of problems yeah definitely mental health problems associated with that age group. I think just in just in England there were 6,500 male suicides in a year which is pretty stunning isn't it when you think it's a, each of the unit of pain is one um, so it's a uh, I mean, not that I have any answers, but it, they, it, I certainly never set out to write the story about that, but it sort of appears. And this is not about suicide, I hate to do as you know, this is about, um, and this woman still <coughs> will not be able to think about the casualties, in it, it, the Iraqi casualties, but suddenly it's come home, hasn't it? Suddenly someone in her own family, she understands that we really were involved, that we really were there. And, um, yeah, but I do notice that it, um, this figure of these vulnerable young men, I've got a daughter, and I see these very confident young women, lovely young women, but I think, and love, they are some absolutely lovely young men, but I think it's quite tough for them dealing with us, you know, but younger, and, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's um, vulnerability is, is part of the kind of fascist recruitment, like looking for exactly. lost, angry young men, like that's the demographic there. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, sequencing, actually, I noticed your, um, well, the, the order I read the, uh, your stories in, um, I was piecing together the timelines, which is very very interesting because there's recurring characters and, and um, I was wondering how are you going to sequence it? Is it going to be chronological? Or, or? I haven't decided to be honest but just the idea for this is obviously my first collection of short stories but um, each short story is standalone but I just got the idea that all the short stories have ca the same characters pop up again and again is the first thing because I like that idea as a reader and the second thing is yeah chronologically it jumps so the story that I'm reading this evening is 1995, a character called uh, Frankie Barron. And I've just written the story last week, which concerns Frankie Barron in 2019. So I haven't figured out yet how I'm going to do that. I may do it chronologically, or it may be more interesting to just scatter them, I don't know. Yeah. Would you like to read that story for us? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> So, as I just said there, this story um, is from the perspective of Frankie Barron, and he's a 23-year-old male. He's from Cork. He's two or three years out of UCC. And this particular weekend, it's the 9th of August, 1995. Fela was a music festival that was held in Thurles for a number of years, and the last year it was ever held was held in Cork. I don't know who organised it, but it's still considered to be one of the most incredible sort of musical lineups that Ireland has ever had. So this guy, Frankie Barron, and his friends, two or three years out of UCC, and they meet Moby, who's a, a famous um, musical star. But I suppose the key thing about the story for me is that it's, it's 1995, so it's that particular moment where there is internet, but it hasn't really taken off. Some people have mobile phones, but most don't. There are no camera phones. There's no H&M. There's no Topshop. So people style their own clothes what I would sort of term the sort of pernicious kind of global force of capitalism haven't taken hold yet. The boom is starting to heat up that it hasn't happened. So these characters, you could say that the scene was more in Ireland, more local, maybe even parochial, but I think I would submit that there was something individual about it and that there's something kind of sad about this because it's all just about to be lost. Moby and Us, fail in 1995. One hot August weekend in 1995, we watched Moby jump around the stage, bouncing from decks to keyboards like a ball grasshopper to the beat of the stomping tune go. It's my opinion that Moby is in a similar condition to us. We dance around jostling, wanting to be noticed. It's an Irish summer with distinctive sights, prong pink skin spilling out of clothes, freckles, farmer's tans, pale shins and shorts, skirts scalloped around fleshy haunches and a sea of breasts. Go on, you good thing. The evening is all Second City flash, romance hangs in the air. My money is on Johnny and Julie getting it together, me cracking on to Lady Una, although this optimism may be chalked down to MDMA. 
In years to come, this weekend's musical lineup will be considered iconic and good value before concert promoters start taking the Celtic Tiger piss. People will talk about it, even those who weren't there or who can't remember due to having been off their chop. There's a strong sense of shoving it up Dublin's hole. Musically, Corconians are hanging with the big dogs. <coughs> After the set, we walk to the edge of the swarm for a breather. Some young one is giving mouth to mouth to a lad stretched flat out of the grass. Romeo and Juliet, Johnny says. Julie smiles, she's wearing a tennis dress and bunches in her hair. He looks like there should be a chalk outline drawn around him. A lad in an Oasis t-shirt wanders past, missing his trousers. He wears a peaked cap saying, God. Sexy beast, Leggy Una says. Her eyes are like saucers. An old one threads the crowd, handing out miraculous medals, saving souls. Sir Henry's time, Julia says. I consider going against her. Julia part of the Cork diaspora, back for the weekend from Paris, is prone to getting her way, but I keep my gob shut. Leggy Una is Julia's, co uh, Julia's cousin and a lasher in her hot pants and Johnson's baggy powder t-shirt, which is stretched fetchingly across her tits, riding up to expose a neat belly button. We leave the porky queef grounds, passing a crew with raver's hats, sitting around a pyre of crushed beer cans. One of them calls out to Johnny, All right, Cham, Johnny says, putting on more of an accent than he has. I secure Joe Maxi, we pile in, quizzing down the docks, past the dark lapping waters of the River Lee, lights fizzing like halos. I decide I may be in there. We're three years out of UCC. And though I've dropped out of my master's and I'm doing security for a warehouse on the outskirts of the city, so my parents bleat in my ear morning, noon and night about my future. Tonight, nothing can touch me. Sweat at Sir Henry's. Sir Henry's is a sweaty, dark, dirty box on one side of the Grand Parade Hotel with poor ventilation. It smells of underarms, crotches and poppers, but you fall for it. We dance, the fathers and mothers-to-be of the Instagram generation, a tangle of writhing bodies. We've poor skin, outfits cobbled together from stinking second-hand shops, hair dyed at home in the sink, no man bones, no brows that resemble nice swooshes, no fixie bikes. We haven't yet taken the bait. Nobody is getting on the ladder. The country remains unmortgaged to canny crowds who will lend us yo-yos to buy their high-powered cars and designer fridges. Most sons and daughters of Aaron don't have mobiles. There's nobody to take incriminating shots. We can do what we like. Two lads rub Vic Bakers in each other's chests like lovers. An old guy in slacks watches proceedings from a small platform. It's rumoured that he's drug squad. If so, he's bad at his job. <laughs> we stretch our arms upwards to the rafters where the Galway DJ, suspended like a modern-day messiah, splices that familiar Polish pagan tune voice into the tune. Young people of Ireland, I love you. This elicits a cheer as if the risen Lord had come down upon our ecstasy-anointed heads. Fleetingly, the Pope is the main man. It's the last tune. The lights go up. We drift to the after party in the Fireside pub downstairs, part of the same complex aptly named. There's a queue at the door. It's like a war zone. The wounded, the shell shocked, the bug eyed, the desperate. Those without a pub's chance of getting in, trying to push on through and keep the party going. <coughs> the general manager casts an eye over the rabble. With his blonde ponytail, skimmed milk pallor, he looks like the rock and roll version of the milky kid. Naturally, Julia is beckoned forward. There with me, Lady Godiva says, pointing to us with her I'm with the band face. There's a question mark over Johnny who gurns at the manager. I can hear the clacking of his jaws. He lights a cigarette the wrong way around. He's fine, Julia says, taking Johnny by the hand. I'll keep an eye on him. The manager nods, leaving to deal with some young one, repelling down the side of the DJ booth. We tunnel through the door. Sweep on me, fat and greasy citizens, Johnny says under his breath. He's always spouting shit like that. Keep it together, you langer, I say. My t-shirt is damp with sweat, the place is jammers, the bar is opening, although in my condition I'm a great thirst for water. The Galway DJ nods his big foxy-headed lady Una. She throws him a look. I smell competition. We find a spot settle in. Julia and Leggy Una go dancing. I drain my glass of water in three long sweets. Johnny chews gum, tossing it around in his mouth like clothes in a spin cycle. I'm momentarily too gone to dance, riding the crest of a narcotic wave. Instead, I revel in the glorious barber's carnage. There's no VIP area, which, as Johnny pointed out, makes sense. The concept of a very important person in Ireland is oxymoronic, Bono being the sole indigenous, very important cult on this island. <laughs> I feel like dragging my old pair down here, showing them the democracy of it, the egalitarian vibe, where every man, jack and child is off their head, working class, middle class, and nobody gives a fuck. Frank Senior, did you hear the latest crack? My mother says, pounds on her hips. Frankie wants to do the H-dip. You the points to do commerce, for God's sake. You could go in with your Uncle Flory developing. He's making serious moolah. 
I'm flying a two man. I see a skinny fellow in shorts and a t-shirt drawing to Julie at the bar. It's Moby, but I accept it. Everything about this, everything about this day seems stand out. The Odyssey to Montanotti. We tackled the short, sharp slope of the Himalayas that is St. Patrick's Hill. Glad to turn onto Wellington Road, a long hill that meanders upwards to St. Luke's Cross, buzzing past the faded gentility of the 19th century houses, their gardens sloping to meet us. We're a motley crew, us and our pal Moby, international superstar. <laughs> For once I want to meet my brother, hanging with this future captain of industry pals with their rugby shirt collars up, fresh from squaring nice girls around the dance floor in more respect to the meat markets. Why can't you be more like your brother Billy, my mother says. He's flying it up in Dublin working for Anglo-Irish Bank. That fellow will go far. <laughs> so many ways to answer my mother's question. It could be down to genetics, ma'am, or a lack of desire to work for a bank and date a girl who's already picked out her big gap from the road to Stone Road or whatever the Dublin equivalent is and given her imaginary 2.2 kids double barrel names. I enjoy the mental imagery of introducing Moby to my brother. At the intersection of York Street, Spoofer Hurley is on top of us before we see his small head balanced on his long, lanky body. He carries a plastic bag of cans and wears a Red Republic of Cork t-shirt. Just finish my shift, he says, raising his hand in a salute. Spoofer works at an off-license that has shut hours ago. He zeroes in on Moby. It's an honour to meet you, Moby, he says, shooting out his hand. Julie looks put out. She makes eyes at Lady Una, who adjusts her furry bag on her shoulder. It's pom-poms jiggling doubtfully at the prospect of kicking around with Spoofer. But Spoofer Hurley, not a man to be put off, joins the caravan. I've a baggy oaks, he says to Julia. This mollifies her. Spoofer, who is what I call a professional Cork person, points out landmarks to Moby, giving him a pot of history of the city. Cork was burned by British forces in 1920. Patrick Street City Hall, but we resisted Moby. Like an elongated bantam head, Spoofer jerks his head forward, speaking in capital letters. The ghosts of hunger-striking Lord Mayors, brandy-sipping murdered RIC divisional commissioners, and flying columns drift over the city. Hang the rebels, Spoofer shouts, so Julie shushes him. Moby's listening eyes gleam back. It's unclear whether he understands the melodious sing-song of Spoofer's accent, the syllables tumbling out was gone. We mosey past our lady's hospice where my aunt lies dying, the cancer eating her from the inside out. All right, Auntie Mary. Johnny commandeers an abandoned shopping trolley on the side of the road, knocking spoof for arse over tit into it. We pass the stained glass windows of Hench's pub, the little hopster shop. German supermarkets are yet to arrive, offering their no-fill service, pushing the small players out. From his carriage, under the shape-shifting moon, Spoofer continues in his tour guide voice, not yet spent with his core quackery. That little octagonal green hut there was a toll booth for collecting tax and livestock coming into the city. There's a hallucinogenic quality to the light. The air has an orange glow that I love. I love everyone. I love Cork. I've no interest in moving to Dublin. We reach the top of the hill. Julie lives in Lover's Walk. It's really called Leper's Walk, Spoofer says, on account of the leper colony once being here. He sniffs, a fag glued to his wet lip. Unsurprisingly, the name didn't catch on, what with the high Montanati homes and those who live here. <laughs> Julie deadpans, nothing is gained by teaching a parrot a new word. Moby laughs, nodding in recognition. Julie's family home is set on the road with a deceptive, unimposing entrance. She lives in one of those tall, creaking, period, north side houses that some people go mad for. My mother doesn't think much of them. A lot of maintenance pouring money into a home, she says. My mother is mad for ensuite bathrooms and walk-in wardrobes. You could call her a pioneer. Soon she'll be joined by many others when the disease of infecting greed spreads like a virus. We avoid the main door with its fan light, instead of setting the stone steps to the basement creeping in the bottom door. Julia turns the key, putting her finger to her lips, shooting us a warning look. Inside she steps in a small brown dog, causing him to yell. Uh, Spoofer scoops him up, patting his head. All right, Lassie? Julia leads us to a drawing room. It's like a den with he he heavy velvet drapes and no lit lamps, which cast shadows on the flock wallpaper. Once Julie is through flicking switches, swanky gas, Spoofer says, lifting his nose with a finger. Through the crack are the lights of court, but only the six of us exist holed up in this cocoon. Julie fetches water. Spoofer majestically hands around cans and pills before sinking into a beanbag with the dog under his arm. We set an informing little satellites, my ears drum, my eardrums hum. Cigarette poised in a gesture of Parisian sophistication, Julie talks to Moby about photography, renowned galleries in Paris. Do you know the Jeu de Pomme? Johnny sits opposite Moby and Julie, interjecting the odd word, although I know the lad has never set foot in Paris. Conversation travels along several paths. It's universally agreed that the internet is a fad. Would you be bothered with it, Julie says. <laughs> I guess people have a need to communicate, Moby says in soft American twang. 
Lady Eunice sits in my lap, telling me about a drama course in Dublin, about wanting to be an actress. Her cigarette burns towards his tip without her noticing it. Only Moby doesn't smoke. She'll never be famous with that beak, Spoofer says when Lady Eunice goes to Jack. She should get a nose job. Mm. Lady Eunice's nose almost tags her face, but she's sexy in a smudgy way. I would like to kiss that large curved mouth. Shut up, boy, I say. Looking for the shift, Spoofer says. He rolls joints, licking skins with a flourish, spinning lines about his low-level drug dealing, acting like a fiend, his burner mobile ostentatiously displayed next to him. Straight out of toker, Johnny says. Scarface, I say. Cork's answer to Tony Montana. The pills work their magic. Time passes in that murky underwater way where it seems to sit still while simultaneously the hands of the clock race forward. I receded to my thoughts, rubbing leggy in his thigh. Moby raps about his great grand uncle being Herman Melville. He wrote Moby Dick. Johnny and Julia are very taken with this. No way, boy, Spoofer says, although he's probably never read a line of print. Holy <laughs> fucking dick. <laughs> he knocks a pile of newspapers and gardening magazines onto the ground. A door opens. We raise our eyes to Julia's mother in a pink fluffy dressing gown. It's belt tied with a maternal purpose that seems out of kilter with her sleep blurry eyes. She moves her hand metronome style in front of her face in the smoke. What the hell is going on here, Julia? Mrs. Hearn quells the room with livid, searching eyes. She seems to loom over us, but from afar like a fucking apparition. The grandfather clock clicks. Mrs. O'Hurley throws an eye open. What kind of hour do you call this? Spoofer struggles to keep his eyes in his sockets. Julie leads her mother outside. Through the open door, we hear stage whispers. Don't do this to me, Mum. I'm begging you. He's a famous musician. <laughs> Moby, Moby seems unfazed. I don't care who this Moby person is. It's five o'clock in the morning. The negotiations continue. Then Julie slides back in with her mother in tow. Can you play something classical for my mother, Moby? Ah, sure. Ah. Moby slides over to the piano, seating himself in the bass top stool, hands poised. As he plays, Julie's mother edges forward, leaning against the wall. When he finishes, we clap. I don't know who you are, Julie's old doll says, addressing our celebrity, but anyone who plays Chopin like that is welcome in my home. Keep it down. <laughs> she retreats. <laughs> nice one, Moby, Spoofer says, crushing a cannon sound. You're a legend. Farewell, Moby. Outside, the stars melt into the dawn. We move into the kitchen. Julia fills the kettle. I could murder a cup of Barry, Spoofer says, hamming it up. Julia and Lady Una move between the stove and the table. Toast, the smell of rashers and sausages on the pan. We're clueless that Herman Melville's descendant is a vegan, a militant animal rights activist, unlikely to appreciate the sizzle of animal fats. This is pre the internet, and vegans are thin on the ground on the lee shores. We set to sipping and eating. Julia makes a cup of Earl Grey tea for Moby, who eats a piece of toast, even though it's been sitting cheap by jowl with clonic, kilty bacon and pudding. This is the measure of the man we agree later, Moby's a gentleman. Now, Johnny watches Julia <coughs> set down Moby's tea with an assessing look in his face. Johnny still believes he can have Julia. You can't beat a rasher, Spoofer says, segueing into talking about his long-held, much-repeated plans to move to London. He cocks his head back. His voice almost gives. I mean, what about Cork? In fairness, would you want to be anywhere else? I've mostly seen the inside of a tour bus, Moby says, but Cork rocks. I tell Lady Eunice, who's talking up Dublin, that I might move there. I may get into the property game with my uncle. That avenue is open to me. Best view of Dublin is the one in the rear view mirror, Spoofer says. I will surrender to the ambition I see reflected from my mother's face. This is no country for teachers, my mother scorn says. Everyone must produce and get aboard the train before it leaves the station. Man predicts success. I may even take up golf. Hang me now. Leggy Una runs her nail across my leg. We'll never live this night again. Think of that. Leggy Una dramatises everything that happens to her. Tonight she's much fodder. Moby says in his gentle voice that it's time to head. Soon he'll be moving on to another city. I need sleep, he says, his hands in his pockets. Cheers, Moby man, Spoofer says, clapping him on the back as if saying goodbye to a relative about to embark on a long journey. Spoofer rips off his t-shirt, flashing the beginnings of a small paunch to Johnny Whistles. For you, Spoofer says, handing Moby his Republic of Cork t-shirt. Moby shakes his bullet head. I insist, Moby boy, Spoofer says. A memento of your time in Cork. It's hugs all round. Julia walks Moby outside. A morning chill creeps in the door. The light has turned grey. Our reservoir of serotonin is dipping. Julia comes back, wielding a slip of paper, which she tucks away. We're going to write to one another. Did you see Moby's dick? Spoofer says, warming his arm cheeks in the agate. Julia tells him where to go, but you can tell she likes the mock inquiry. You missed your moment there, Johnny says with a sour milk look. But Julia goes to sit next to him, so he perks up. Lady Una lays a pound to my face. I'm cold. I wrap her in my jacket. The innocence of it. A couple of kids enjoying the warm glow of each other's company. 
the strata of our lives not yet laid down, unaware that in the far future, Moby will write his autobiography about being a drug, ad a drug addict, sex addict. One of us will die in a car crash flung through the windscreen. Another will get up in a chair with a length of rope under a black maw of death dangling there until the police kick the door in. And not a single photo has been taken all night. We'll have to rely on memory when we nostalgically recall Moby in us. Every generation has a moment. I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but <laughs> <laughs> let's see if I can find it. I was, I was, I was struck uh, when I first read it about the, um, you know, you have that kind of rebellious, I'm going to go my own way, which kind of lines up with the with the characters, you know, um, taking yokes essentially, but then with the come down, you know, I'll surrender to the ambition in my mother's face. Um, yeah, that kind of contrast and the you know, the joy of youth and then finding out where things end up, you know, the kind of allusions to the rise of, of the Catholic Tiger and the, and the fall. And is that, is, was that kind of, um, yeah, how much do you think about that kind of stuff? How much is it just, um, you know, how much do you know about a story, I guess, before you, before you start writing it? Uh, well, there are two different questions, but the, the second part of the question is I don't really know much about a story. I, I, you know, I get an idea and then I have to write it really quickly and then I refine it. The first part is in terms of that story, I think I kind of introduced it by saying for me, I think, I mean, I'm middle-aged and it's the responsibility of middle-aged people to be nostalgic and think that their time is best. That's just your duty. But, I mean, if younger people were here, like my son's age, they just snort, you know, snort and roll their eyes, probably quite rightly. But I suppose that, that 1995 and that time is just before um, the Celtic Tiger and the global um, economic boom. And as I already said, I just think... I just think there was a great, you mentioned the characters kind of being free in that. There was a great freedom, if you think about it. Like, if you're sending young people out now, you have to remind them from when they're quite young in their early teens. You have to be very conscious that when they go on Twitter, that they're speaking not to just one person, but, you know, lots of people. They have to be careful who photographs them. You have to train them when they're out not to allow people to take incriminating photographs. They shouldn't put photographs up on their social media because it could militate against them. They, could make, they might never be able to get rid of them. So I suppose, think about it then, you could do exactly what you liked, you know? That's the first thing. There was nobody to take photos. And the second thing was like, because there wasn't that internet and because there wasn't massive amounts of kind of money washing through the country, there was something kind of, there was a great freedom in that time, you know? There was, you know? Yes. Um. Oh, sorry, the other thing I wanted to say as well is, I think you mentioned there about, so Frankie Barron is 23, and Frankie kind of dropped out of doing his master's, and Frankie is, you know, he's thinking of maybe doing the H-chip and becoming a teacher, but his mother is ambitious for him, and her definition of ambition does not include being a teacher, and I think certainly during the Celtic Tiger, when it really, it's worst excesses, I got a sense that a lot of people weren't valued unless they were making money. And, and Frankie's mother was one of those. And I think the sad thing about poor old Frankie is in another story in the collection, which I wrote, Frankie ends up hanging himself. That's alluded to in the story there. I don't know whether that was, whether people caught that or not. He's the guy who in 2019 hangs, hangs himself because he becomes a property developer. And I suppose what I'm saying is that maybe Frankie wants to be a history teacher, but there was that pressure to become something else. So it's not that straightforward, but... I do feel that that's something I certainly felt, I, I suspect a lot of people felt it as well, that there was a very narrow definition of success and it was very unhealthy and we know how it ended anyway for lots of people. Yeah. Um, well, as we're getting close to our time, uh, Maggie, you wanted to share uh, a short piece. Well, if we have to end at half past, perhaps we should go to questions. It's just I've written, a, I'm writing, trying to write about what's happening at the moment exactly at the moment in Parliament and outside it and it's a sort of little it's a kind of satirical mm. well, do it. Um, is that allowed though where's the director let me kick outside 
Oh, no, I just want to say I thought the end of your story was absolutely brilliant. It's Because um, short stories really all about the ending, aren't they? Yeah. That's what makes the form. That's why it's not a novel. But I loved it. Okay, so this is near the last section of this poem, which was inspired by Louis McNeese's wonderful autumn journal, um, which was written in 1939. It's eight years later. And you remember it was written just before the Second World War, 39, in autumn. Um, and we're coming to a bad moment too, I think. You, you're not direct, I mean, you are in the firing line here in a very big way, but I know you're in Europe here, but we feel completely torn and devastated by it, I think. Um, okay, so it begins um, with Boris. It's slightly before where we've got to, he's had the Scottish judgment against him, uh, pro him, and he's had the English judgment against him. We haven't got to that wonderful moment when we suddenly understood why we have judges. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. The law's gone through that forces more delay, but Boris claims he won't obey it. No, he would prefer to die in a ditch. Surrenderville, he names it. Yes, he must, in theory, go to beg his enemies in Brussels to defer until we have a deal, but no, that's just in theory. Some of us infer that when marauders pour down Downing Street, the doorstep policemen should not stir to stop them knocking Boris off his feet. Maybe he's gone too far, though the High Court in London will not restrain him. Scotch law on its metal says he has lied to the Queen, which sounds like treason. Parliament must come back, or it's illegal. Out in the street, we start to look more cheerful. Maybe Britain does still retain some grandeur if, when barbarians shut Parliament, the courts aren't fearful of calling Boris on his lack of candour. Stop, though, how weak our system has become, as in Uganda, Turkey, or Zimbabwe. Only the senior judges have their thumb in the whole dike that shields democracy. Well, but among Boris's crimes, there's one that has, for me, the clearest ring of doom. He used the phrase in rank bad faith as an Etonian, but still I hear it echo down our days. If the opposition call for more delays to Brexit, let them appeal, he says, to our masters, the people. No thunderclap, and yet for me the skies in that same instant darken. The die is cast, his chariot is roped to all the fates and furies who have gored emperors in dark Siberian basements, to new Jacobins, fingers crabapple red with bourgeois guts, and populists abroad, Le Pen's blonde hard-faced daughter, right-wing Europeans he claims to shun, white-bred Americans, new Puritans or kooks under Trump's bloated shadow, and the rest. Putin's keen nashi, his teen nationalists. Time for us older Britons hoarding tins to stockpile books, look grave, grave common sense, and do our best. Tell me, what is our best, though? Do we know? What a fate to hate each other if we end up alone, a bag of savage cats in one small shrinking state on one small island. Small might make us truthful. If we get smaller still, we might create new forms, new parties, frail and beautiful as the autumnal leaves piled around our feet. Life will revive, we'll say, after the snows, though we lose what we love, our battered Europe. Mother of tongues of Greece and Rome, of song and sorrows, sinking from view beyond the slope of Ramsgate's rising seas. Oh, must we go? But no, something may yet return. Until the cord is cut, we will remain in love with our beginning, the lost green land bridges of Doggerland. Drag in that boat, its seasick refugees, so no one drowns. Shell-shocked Iranian doctors, lawyers, shivering, laughing students, and the old criminal, and wrap them round in blankets, police car, food before internment, so neither they nor decency go down. For some, let's hope asylum. Oh, but let's go out, my dear. It's late. Politics makes me sick. I ache all over, and it's nearly two o'clock. So while there's light, let's take a last walk on the cliffs of Dover. Oh.